say, ah, the golden age of piracy is not ended. A stout-hearted captain still sails the high seas. After losing an arm and leg in service, I still terrorize the enemy, the devil. Mighty Christian battlings. I, Captain Hook, aim that all children have full share of God's blessings. Salvation through the blood of God's Son be yours, maybe. Every Christian pirate should sail with the Christian flag at high mast. This signals to the enemy, the devil, not willing to give quarter and no mercy. Give God your vessel, matey. Scuttle those old duds and put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Weigh anchor now, ye swabbies. Where be that fascinating treasure? Ah, the treasure be at the altar of salvation. Jesus Christ be the most blessed treasure to be found by wretched man. Avast there, chart your course heaven bound, and remember, matey, beware of Christian pirates. They be out to rescue you from the sea of sin. <laughs> it was April 13th, 1960, in a small town in northwestern Ohio. I remember that day well. A rough crowd of motorcyclists headed down the highway. I didn't realize that tragedy lay waiting for me just a few miles from my home. A car pulled out to pass a semi-truck. He didn't see me on my motorcycle coming from the other direction and hit me head on. I was thrown into a field with half of my body almost torn away. I was unconscious and dying, but worst of all, I was without God. The sirens were screaming, the red lights flashing. They scraped me up and rushed me to the hospital to perform a very serious amputation. The largest piece of bone in my leg was only two or three inches long. My left arm and leg had to be amputated to save my life. Something happened to me in that hospital room. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The Spirit of the Lord tapped on my heart's door. I turned my life over to God. He gave me new hope and determination. And now he's enlisted me to hook boys and girls and to win them because I'm the world's only Christian pirate, Captain Hook. who seek him. Some people think God's a punisher, but you know what we do with child abusers today? We put child abusers in prison if we find out about them. God is not a child abuser. God is a good God. Why don't you just say that out loud with me right now? God is a good God. You always remember that. God is not going to do you harm. There is a judgment coming someday. and trembles at the sound of Jesus' name. So, Jesus, 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 thank God for Jesus' name. Devil is a blabber man. 
the battle, Jesus won the fight. The enemy is conquered, restoring every right. Satan has been paralyzed. He walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Living in the end times, let Bible prophecy teacher John G. Hall answer your questions as he takes you through the book of Revelation. His systematic study will clearly illustrate what we can expect to happen in the future. Watch Prophecy Marches On, Friday mornings at 8.30 Eastern Time. Bed in the Botanica, Sackley and Peter, Josephus writings, some of those, you won't find anything there whatsoever that would bring Russia in, on, in Ezekiel, the 38th and the 39th chapters. The only thing where Russia would come in, not by name, but when the Antichrist goes north in Daniel 11, 44, tidings out of the east, now the north will trouble him here in the middle of the tribulation. And here's where he goes north and actually will conquer Russia in the last days, bringing Russia into the valley of Megiddo and then making his invasion here into Jerusalem here. And here's where communism and all of the isms will be sacrificed and fed to the fowls of the air here. 
So you're hearing a lot about a country today that the Bible has nothing much to say about the honest truth of it. Donna, do you have any comments over there you want to pull in from that book or something of the Bible? The first war will be uh, the Antichrist uh, taking over uh, the countries here of the old Roman Empire. The second will be in Daniel 11, 44, where he goes north and actually will conquer the countries north and east of him. That's another war. And the third war will be down there at the Battle of Armageddon. <laughs> From the campus of Freedom Village, USA, an international ministry dedicated to reaching the teenagers of the United States and Canada, welcome to Victory Today. In a time when our young people are pressured daily by the nightmare of drugs, alcohol, suicide, sexual permissiveness, and abuse, Freedom Village, USA provides a place of second chances and is truly a place of victory. Join your host, the founder and director of Freedom Village USA, Pastor Fletcher Brothers, for this edition of Victory Today. Welcome to Victory Today. I'm Pastor Brothers, and we're glad you're with us. I don't know how many of you saw the article uh, about the school down in, uh, well, it's near Erie, Pennsylvania, that uh, had to cancel its graduation because of a uh, reported suicide pact. But uh, I can tell you, we didn't do that here at Freedom Village. Uh, you come here anytime, any place, anywhere. I guess that's probably one of the great things about this ministry is that uh, you can see what's being done with your gifts and your prayers, and you can come anytime. People are always amazed that, uh, you mean I don't need an appointment? No, stop by. We're glad to have you. And if you catch us at lunchtime or supper time, we'll just pour a little more water in the soup and sit down and talk with the kids. Um, I uh, was following a story down in Mississippi where they had raided a home uh, for troubled young people, very much the same as this. And uh, I got a couple of uh, requests from people for an answer. So let me ask you a question, okay? Do we beat you? No. 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 <laughs> Don't kid yourself. I'd like to a couple times. <laughs> Maggie? <laughs> wow. But uh, uh, that bothered me for quite some time because... I couldn't, uh, couldn't quite adjust to the fact that I'd taken lives, something that I couldn't repay. And uh, it bothered me for a long time, and then I decided that it was more Christian to stand up for our democratic way of life and for our freedom of religion than it would be to let the Nazis or the communists overrun us and take that freedom away. Yes. So you made the decision not only in defending yourself, but as well in defending our country. He's in many ways the most religious of the religions. He was aggressively committed to a way of life that he was convinced was right. Like a Chuck Colson of the 20th century, Paul was known for his aggressiveness. And yet Paul was into more than cutthroat politics. God was like a good college professor. He'd grade on a curve, and on a curve I didn't do so badly. And uh, I hadn't done anything in politics the Democrats hadn't done before me. And so I really thought Chuck Colson was a pretty good guy and that when I died, if there was a heaven, I would be welcomed into it. And it wasn't until I met my friend and he witnessed to me about Christ and something came over me that night and I suddenly felt unclean for the first time in my life and I just, I wanted to be clean. I wanted, and I began to look into my own heart and I realized, sure, I was being accused of all kinds of things in the Watergate and the newspapers, but those weren't the real sins. The real sins was the hatred and the bitterness and the jealousy and the pride and the anger, the animosity towards other people that was deep within me and I realized there's no way I can get rid of that. And then I suddenly realized that that's exactly why Jesus Christ went to the cross and died in, in substitution for me in my place to forgive my sins. And so I think it's so important that people be honest with themselves and not be deluded by uh, the culture which says, I'm okay, you're okay. We're not okay. <laughs> but you're already recorded in the computers in Brussels, Belgium, the common market headquarters, which has computer capacity there to give a number to every man, woman, and child on the face of the whole world. It's already there. It's already in authority. It's all ready to happen. Even showed a documentation and a picture here from the Defense Department Journal showing our Defense Department handling the defense 
terminology to a runner, and he has 666 across the front of his T-shirt, right out of the U.S. Defense Department journals, and this was several years ago. This tract has been tremendously used of God all over the world. I haven't said much about it lately, but you need to get it and to use it because it warns about the mark of the beast that is coming. The purpose of this report is to warn all people that the time for decision has come. You said that young girl reached out and got a hold of the pew in front of her like this. And she trembled like a leaf in the wind, she trembled. And she said to her pastor, she said, I've been backslidden for a long time, and I know that. That's what she said. And I've been away from God. But she said, I can't give my life to God today, and I'll tell you why. Because this week is graduation, and I'm going to the prom, and, and I, I'm going to date this certain boy that's not a Christian, and we're going to go to this big beer, beer party. I know if I give my life to God, the Lord won't want me to do that. And I'll have to refuse. And, but I just want to go. It's the biggest night of school and graduation and on. And I, and I just can't. But after this Thursday, I, I'll come to church next Sunday, and I'll give my life to Jesus Christ. Oh, the subtlety of Satan, the deception of Satan, the deadly word of tomorrow. Before that prom could even take place on a Thursday, that school in New London, Texas exploded. It was a gas explosion, a leak, and it exploded. Called upon, he ran to that school and as he was identifying different ones that they asked him to, they pulled the sheet back that was covering this beautiful child. And according to the pastor, from the neck down, you couldn't tell if it was that of a human being or an animal. From the neck up, he looked into the face of that beautiful young lady four nights earlier had said, Pastor, I'll give my life to God next Sunday night. While that is tragic, I think equally tragic is the words that came from Brother Criswell to that man when he told him in the car heading toward that cemetery. He said to the father of that child, there is a point of no return and you may have crossed over it. I want you to get on the phone and make that pledge right now in Jesus' name. Monique? Yes, Pastor, those, those people who are ill, they're making a, when they plant this seed here, those people who have $10,000 or more to pledge, and they're ill and they're planting that right now yes. by faith for that illness. They're making a covenant relationship with, with Jehovah Rapha. Yes. And that takes it out of the doctor's hands. He is the God that the healeth, healeth thee. thee. And once they make that, that plant and plant that seed here, Jehovah Rapha has to keep the other side of that agreement. And people are going to have praise reports all over this country, That's but right. first they have to make that step of faith and get into <laughs> covenant relationship. If I were a person that was suffering in my body and I was terminal, I mean cancer, or, 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 or the doctor have gave me a certain time to live, I would get busy right now. And I would get busy if I had to shake I don't care how I feel, I would get on that phone right now. I would tell my family, hand me the phone. I'm going to make that pledge, and I would send somebody to the bank and get that money, and send that money here to this ministry and plant that seed so that you can get that miraculous in your body. God is not a man that will lie, but he's a God that tells the truth. I'm going to give you time to call in. I'm going to give you an opportunity to call in, brother. I'm going to give you an opportunity to call in. I'm excited. I'm excited about what God is saying. expressed on the preceding program do not necessarily represent the views or beliefs of the Trinity Broadcasting Network or its affiliate stations.
better pray for South Africa and all of Africa because, listen to this, if Marxism, communism takes over all of Africa and they're making phenomenal inroads from the north to the south and the east and the west, Christianity will be lost in evangelism to Africa because of communism. But if Africa turns to free enterprise democracy, it'll be open to the preaching of the gospel and the spreading of the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, Africa is one of the most incredible countries of the world. I have all kinds of preachers down there in South Africa that want me to come and minister in their churches. And I hope I'll have the opportunity next year, 1989, to go down to South Africa, Pretoria, Johannesburg, Durban, Cape Town, various areas that I've been invited to go to. Those precious ministers, black and white, believe in Jesus Christ. They tell us that the African National Council is dominated now by communists. They're trying to overthrow the white government. You say, how does all this fit into prophecy? Luke 21, 25, on the earth, distress of nations. Luke 21, 10, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is part of the political turmoil of the world right now, fitting into those pre days of pre, shall I say, pre-second coming days of tribulation. The world is in a state of tribulation. We're going to enter into greater tribulation, and these are the signs that it is already beginning. Now, in closing the program in just a few minutes, I want to pray for the people of South Africa, but I also want to pray for you and your home. Even as we take a look at Africa and see communism making phenomenal inroads, taking over country after country after country after country, and we pray for them to be set free so that the gospel will be preached, keeping in mind that every country that goes Marxist closes the door to Christianity, kicks out the missionaries, and essentially almost terminates business and goes into depression like Ethiopia. We must pray for Africa. I want to encourage you to pray for the African Christians as you go to bed tonight. And any other night, just ask God to bless the African Christians. Many of them are starving in Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea, Mozambique, Angola, Namibia, and they need your prayers. Let's pray one for another because we are concerned with them and we are our brother's keeper. Communism, Marxism, socialism is trying to squash Christianity. By the way, the major reason for the, the millions that are starving in Ethiopia, Somalia, and Eritrea, many of them are Christians, and the communists don't want them to exist any longer. We don't hear that in the papers today, so pray for the Christians of Ethiopia, Mozambique, Zambia, and the others that are down there. And let me pray right now that God will speak to the hearts of the leaders of South Africa, apartheid will end, and the wisdom of heaven will be theirs to enjoy to give a proper solution to the problems of that great Christian country. It's more Christian than it is anything else. And when you think of South Africa, you're thinking of a predominantly powerful Christian country. Let's pray for our brothers. Loving Heavenly Father, we pause on our program today thinking about the heartaches of about 490 million black people as well as several million white people in the country of Africa. And I pray that from Morocco and all the way down to Cape Town and from Cairo to Namibia and Angola, that peace will come to Africa, tribe will stop fighting tribe, and Christianity and not Marxism will be the predominant theme of Africa. I pray that Africa will get more of the gospel through Christian television, Christian radio, and Christian missionaries and ministers than ever before as we soon enter into the decade of the 90s. Strengthen our ministers, our pastors, our evangelists, television, radio, musicians, singers, teachers, and medical missionaries that are all over Africa. God strengthen their hearts. And while we who are at home enjoy all of the benefits and luxuries of America, our hearts go out to Africa tonight as we pray for those precious black Christians who are suffering under Marxism and the white Christians that are suffering in many, many areas. We pray for the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ and that thy richest blessings will be upon Africa. And last but not least, Lord, Give us many television towers from one end of Africa to the other, broadcasting the gospel of Jesus Christ into the country of nearly 500 million blacks and whites. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Gentlemen, Secretary of State George Shultz, he is not only a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, he's one of the executive members of the CFR. And frankly, from my point of view, thinking about George Shultz, I think many of his decisions are far more related to improving the position of the CFR in controlling world affairs 
and improving the position of mega bankers, big bankers, than his decisions are to improve the position and condition of the United States. There have been times when President Ronald Reagan and George Shultz have been at odds at one, one with another especially over the situation in Nicaragua. They do not agree. They do not agree on the situation in South Africa. Mr. Reagan doesn't believe in economic sanctions against the government of South Africa. Secretary of State George Shultz, representing the Council on Foreign Relations and their international global plans for one world government, very often he makes decisions related to the CFR, not to the Secretary of State that would really be to the benefit of the United States. Frankly, he makes me sick. But that's a personal opinion, and don't blame TBN or any of the independent stations that may be airing this program for my decisions. I'm a Canadian. I'm not an American. Okay. Meanwhile, you have produced some what I call subversive organizations that aren't necessarily um, Union Jack, Old Glory, uh, Apple Pie, and July the 4th. And the CFR, in my estimation, works far more for world government than it does for the government of the United States. And that brings me to the other one that you saw on the screen, TLC. That is not tender loving care. That's the Trilateral Commission, which, by the way, is part of the Fed, in a sense, because they're all tied into the Federal Reserve System, the Council on Foreign Relations. What is the TLC? How does it differ from the CFR? Well, the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, is strictly American. The TLC is Trilateral Commission. The Latin word for tri is the Latin word meaning three, three areas. The Far East, originally it was Japan. Now, of course, it's South Korea and other Orientals are involved. All of Europe, point number two, and all of North America, United States and Canada. <coughs> I remember when Trudeau was the prime minister of my original country of Canada. He was a first-class mess in my estimation. Aren't you glad I never get political? But anyway, Trudeau was a sophisticated hippie with a big rose hanging out of his mouth and sandals on his feet. <clears throat> anyway, don't get me off on him. He brought Canada into the metric system because he was a member of the CFR. Socialism is part of the Council on Foreign Relations, and socialism is the government of the super-rich. The government owns everything, distributes everything, controls everything, but most of it goes into the pockets of the so-called Politburo members of the socialistic government. Look at Russia as a classic example. Who drives the Rolls-Royce and the fancy cars of Russia? Certainly not the man on the street, not even the average teacher. As I told you originally, the average teacher in Russia makes 3,000 a year. The average teacher in America, 30,000 a year. She's not driving a car. She may not have a telephone. She may barely have a black and white television. Who are the rich of Russia? The socialistic leaders of the Kremlin. About 5,000 members of the Communist Party that sit at the top of 288 million people controlling commerce, trade, industry, and military development of Russia. Now, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, good Lord, this program's, this whole series is going to take me a year and a half. The CFR want one world government. They want a socialistic type government as you have in Sweden and Belgium and the Netherlands. I got in a cab the other day in Brussels, Belgium, and the cab driver and I were talking about the cost of living in Belgium compared to America. Then he got off on the fact, what are your taxes? I said, anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. He said, good night, ours begin at 65 percent. We have socialistic government in the country of Belgium. 65 percent of that man's salary went to pay taxes. I said, well, that means you get government benefits. He said, yeah, wonderful government benefits. You line up for three years to get a two-bedroom apartment, and maybe you'll get it at the end of three years. He said, socialism doesn't work. He said, it's just kind of putting the money into the pockets of the big boys. And that's where we're headed in biblical prophecy, getting back to that for just a moment in the decade of the 90s. I guess you've seen the trade magazines in the U.S. and European magazines lately. They're espousing the message of the CFR and the Trilateral Commission. One world government, headquarters in Europe, developed by 1992. Secretary of State George Shultz said just recently on television, we can no longer think of ourselves as an individual nationalistic country with just our own constitution. He said, we have to think in terms of the global world. We're totally inter interdependent on other nations. Matter of fact, if you drove a car to work today or home tonight, as you're watching this television program or watching it on video cassette, probably 17 different countries went into the making up of your automobile. The rubber tires in South America, the, the vinyl steering wheel in Korea, and on down the line. We have diversified industry to the third world countries. And that's another foolish trick of the CFR and the Trilateral Commission to get us into a one world government position. 
been driving down the highway lately and seen the, uh, the kilometer signs. Oh, 100 kilometers to the next town. Well, that's about 66 miles. Whoever passed legislation in America taking us into that particular metric situation? I don't remember anybody passing legislation, but we're going metric. Canada's already gone metric. Good night. I have trouble with quarts and gallons. And now I've got leaders and... Leaders? I thought that was for pigs, a litter of pigs. But anyway, my point is not so much that she touched him, but it's how she touched him. Because lots of people were touching him and bumping into him. In fact, the moment this woman pressed through and touched him, Jesus I'm going to say that right now. Did anybody feel that? Yeah. I felt that. She touched him as an act of obedience and faith. You're in constant bondage by the chains of Satan. Do the forces of fear, depression, alcohol, drugs have you bound? You have the authority and the power in Jesus Christ to break the chains that bind you. It's Dwight Thompson's desire for you to experience all of God's power in your life. Through today's program, you can receive a very special television offer, Destruction or Deliverance Audio Tape Library, six powerful cassette messages, The Fourth Man, God Gives the Promise, The Greater One Indwells You, Putting on the Whole Armor of God, The Devil Can't Take Your Song, and Jesus, The Power of Change. All six tapes come in a colorful cassette holder for your love gift of $25 or more. By ordering through this telecast, you'll receive a free bonus tape of today's message, Freed from the Chain of Bondage. Seven tapes in all. Write today and request your set of the Destruction or Deliverance Tape Library. Write to Dwight Thompson, Post Office Box 1122, Downey, California, 90240. You know, just when I thought it was all over... A hand lifted me high in the air. It was my shepherd. Was I happy to see him? And my shepherd was happy to see me, too. He forgave all the bad things I did that day. And do you know why? Because my shepherd is Jesus, the good shepherd. He always forgives us, no matter what. Really, Jesus loves us in a very special way. He's the best friend anyone could have. Would you like to help me sing this song to him? Our good shepherd loves each one of us. He takes care of us. He keeps us safe. We'll always stay with our shepherd. Our shepherd loves us one and all. We'll always stay with our shepherd, our shepherd loves us one and all. We'll always stand behind you with our shepherd, our shepherd knows us each by name. Shepherd loves us one 
Otto was a good boy who loved his mother and his father. One day, Saul's mother and father sent him to a school in Jerusalem. There he learned all about God from a kind and holy man. The years passed, and Saul was very happy. Now, there was one thing that Saul did not learn in school. He did not learn about Jesus. When he grew up, Saul didn't want to hear people talking about Jesus. Because Saul did not know Jesus, he did not love him. Poor Saul. Soon he began to hurt the people who did love Jesus. He even put them into jail. Saul thought he was doing the right thing because he didn't know that Jesus is God. One day, Saul told his friends, I'm going in to the city of Damascus, and I'm going to put everyone who believes in Jesus into jail. But as he was traveling along the road, a bright light <laughs> suddenly flashed all around him. Saul! Saul, why are you hurting me? Who are you? I am Jesus, the one you were hurting. Now Saul understood. He thought, when I hurt the friends of Jesus, I'm really hurting Jesus because he loves his friends. In the name of Jesus, stand up on your feet. The man stood up. I can walk. I can walk. Oh, thank you. Everyone was happy. But there were some bad men in the crowd. Watch out. This man is dangerous. He'll only give us trouble. We'll have to get rid of him. They began to shout at him, the bad men. Here, throw some stones at him. Get out of here. The people threw rocks at Paul until they thought he was dead. But when the bad men were gone, Paul got up. The next day, he set out for another town. When Paul finally had his trial, the emperor set him free. But later, Nero became angry at Jesus' followers, and he had many of them arrested and killed. Paul was one of them. Since Paul loved Jesus so much, he was happy to die for Jesus. This is what St. Paul would say to us today. Now I am living with Jesus in heaven, and I'm very happy. If you pray, I will help you to love God. I will help you become good and holy, too. But did you know that there are still many people who do not know Jesus and who do not love him? You can do what I did. Learn about Jesus. Then you'll be like me, a good friend of Jesus. Praise the Lord, child of God. It's good to be with you today. Hey, you know, probably one of the most frustrating things is to have a call of God on your life to a specific ministry and not have any uh, one else that has that call that you know about and you don't. How do you get started? I had this happen to me years ago. When I went to Bible college, I went there to study. I had no intention of getting a ministry started. And all of a sudden, being a few miles from Waynesville, Missouri, uh, realizing that the great uh, uh, Korean conflict was taking, uh, excuse me, the Vietnam uh, War was taking so many people, young men, out of our nation, into the military, and many of them to their graves, I started going up and ministering on the streets to servicemen. Well, immediately it exploded, and, and, and I had to drop out of college for a few years just to take care of that ministry that exploded while I was in my freshman year at school. Now, here's what happened. I wanted some, how do you minister to servicemen? And I started trying to find ministries that had had that experience or that had maybe written a book on it. There was nothing available. I know the feeling. And some of you have that same problem right now. You see, 
there is a ministry of giving. There is the ministry of the giver. And where would you, I mean, and you're saying, I want to give to God. I want to, oh, Brother Paul, I want to buy a station. Uh, uh, oh, I want to buy a whole uh, month of satellite time. Uh, praise God, I want to pay for that antenna. And that kind of stuff is just in your spirit. And it just, where do you go, though, to find out? You say to someone else, you know, I'd like to give a million dollars to God. And they look at you and say, wow, what's the matter with you? It's not because they don't love the Lord. It's because you have a calling to a biblical office. There is the officer of the giver in the church. Let me in the eighth verse, are he that giveth, right in the offices. There's an office of the giver. Let him do it with liberality. Now, see, here's the instruction to the giver. Here's the instruction to the person that has in your spirit. It's, it, it, it's awakened. And, 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 and you're, you're saying, Brother John, our, our, our Lord, let, let me rephrase that. You're saying, Lord. And uh, of course it's corrupting, but that's the kind of world we live in. But as long as money becomes our God, then, of course, we will uh, bend the rules, or people will bend the rules to, to obtain it. One of the saddest examples of that, I suppose, I mean, was somebody who actually said all those things. Uh, I mean, Jim Baker and Jim and Tammy Baker, I mean, were actually saying some of those things, and yet they were also caught up. I mean, Jim that Baker's must be a, a, very, a great sadness to it, you. I mean, he was sort of a protege of yours. He had Johnny Carson as his role model. He wanted to be like Johnny Carson. He wanted to be a stand-up night talk show host uh, who did a little bit of a stick at the beginning and a few jokes and what have you. Uh, Johnny Carson was reputed to make $5 million a year. He wanted $5 million. If Johnny had a house in Palm Springs, then he wanted a house in Palm Springs. If Johnny rode in a Rolls Royce, he wanted a Rolls Royce. Uh, it depends on who your idol is, who your, who your role model is. Uh, as to Mine has been uh, Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul, and they, they, they live differently. But nevertheless, that is, uh, uh, that's what accounts for some of these things. Yes, because J Jim and Tammy Baker started here, really, in a way, didn't they? They did a lot of their debuts here. I mean, and what went wrong? Somewhere along the way, Johnny Carson supplanted Jesus Christ. Well, I think that uh, it was just two children, very immature, who were incredibly materialistic. That's the, that's the, the bottom line on most of it, is materialism. Uh, you know, who, what is your, is your God, or who is your God? And uh, if, it's, if it's money and possessions, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's what comes uh, primary, preeminent. Oh, one other vital issue okay. question I just thought of right. for you. Are you going to abolish Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that would be totally inappropriate in the national context. <laughs> well, there's a rumor. You don't like it. <laughs> Well, Halloween is a day for witches and for the occult, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, we should celebrate UNICEF during Halloween, but it's pretty much ingrained in our culture. I, as uh, You know, there are many churches who have alternate parties during Halloween for their children. There's a limit to what any president the president shouldn't be, I don't believe, touching Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere. Demonology, witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, blasphemy, suicide, assassination, insanity, sex, perversion, homosexuality, prostitution, Satan worship, gambling, um, barbarism, cannibalism, I mean, sadism, desecration, demon summoning, necromantics, uh, which is forbidden in the Bible, most of these things, divination, and many more teachings. Jerry Falwell would have shot her dead a long time ago. But she says as long as she's alive, she'll fight to keep her PTO home. CNN's Larry Lamont reports. In an appearance near the PTO parsonage that will likely fuel the emotional fires, Tammy Baker said Wednesday they will fight to keep the parsonage in Tiga K. Referring to Jerry Falwell and the PTL, she said... Uh, they keep threatening us that they're going to come and take our house away. In the minutes of the meeting at the board of directors our house was given to us so we are going to go to a lawyer and we are going to try to keep our home uh, that's about all we have left of heritage usa is just our house we've lived there for eight years it's the only house the kids have known and once again the children cry and say daddy please don't let them take our house away from us and of course i would hope that we could keep our home too when reminded that Jim Baker has said he will never sue anyone, 
The former TV co-host said they would first meet with PTL officials to work things out before deciding whether to take legal action. The PTL tried to do that Tuesday night, but the Baker's attorney canceled the meeting. I hope that uh, Jerry Falwell and his family never have to suffer the way that they've made our family suffer. I wake up every morning wishing that they had killed me. And Jim does too. Mrs. Baker said the family has only $37,000 left. But what happened to the large bonuses they received? I do not know. And I say that before God, I do not know. Future plans, she said, still include a new television ministry within 30 days, but did not elaborate. Mrs. Baker said the PTL auction in May is one of her bitterest memories because some of the family's personal possessions were sold off, including their son Jamie's motorized car, causing Jamie to burst into tears. He said, Mom and Daddy, why did they sell my car? Why did they sell my car? And we said, what car, Jamie? And two years ago, Jim had bought Jamie Charles a, a car with a motor in it. And it had, it, we had taken it to have it fixed at the garage. My brother works at a garage, and we had taken the car to have it fixed. And they took Jamie's car that his daddy bought him for Christmas and sold it in the auction. Saying God had helped her overcome her bitterness, she still listed a litany of complaints about Jerry Falwell's treatment accusing his people of ordering guards to quit feeding and watering their dogs, and later sending them to a pound. As it turns out, the dogs were given to two families. She said hundreds of her record albums had been thrown in a dump, and letters and checks from fans had been shredded by PTL officials. PTL Chief Operating Officer Harry Hargrave said recently, records of several PTL singers had been tossed because they were warped and useless and said some shredding occurred when Richard Dorch was running the PTL before Jerry Falwell took full command. Falwell spokesman Mark DeMoss was asked Wednesday if it appeared the Bakers were trying to provoke them to throw them out of the parsonage. He said... If, if we had wanted a fight, we would, have, um, we would have served notice the day after he resigned. We would have pulled his security guards. We would have pulled his maid home. We would have pulled everybody home, and we would have left him... Uh, just with his Palm Springs and Gatlinburg home. Tammy Baker said 99% of what's been said about her and her husband has not been the truth. And she repeated what she said before, that she will put her hand on a Bible and swear to God that the Bakers never gave their ministry to Jerry Falwell. We did not ask Jerry Falwell to take over our ministry. And I will lay my hand on a Bible, which is the most serious thing in the world I could do. I will lay my hand on a Bible and say we did not ask Jerry Falwell to take over our ministry. Jerry Falwell called us long distance, and he told us that Jimmy Swagger was going to do something terrible to our ministry. He said there would be a class action suit, and he said a lot of things, told us a lot of things. Know the plot and tell you we are here to help in any way. We want to help you, Jim and Tammy, help you save your heritage, USD. The buck stopped here. Big buck contributions to TV evangelists dropped off drastically after the PTL scandal of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker and Jessica Hahn. In the financial fallout, even religious charities like the Salvation Army were hurt. The Reverend Jerry Falwell's television ministry says it lost $8 million in televangelism's holy war, with Jimmy Swaggart himself leading the charge. And uh, I don't appreciate preachers that get mixed up in adultery and every other type of sin that one can imagine, and then blaming Jimmy Swaggart for it. Evangelical leaders say the blatant hypocrisy of the Swaggart sex scandal could disillusion millions of other fundamentalist Christians. It's because he has preached so vigorously against sin and naming sexual sin particularly. So uh, I suppose a certain amount of ridicule is understandable. It's, it's grievous, it's tragic. The National Association of Evangelicals said the sex scandal smelled of a sting operation among TV preachers. Here one would suspect, let's say, I'm not making the allegation, one would suspect that somebody was having somebody else tailed. Swaggart hinted as much last year when he blasted his chief accuser, defrocked television evangelist Marvin Gorman. He called me and threatened me. And he stated that uh, he had some documents that he was going to use against me. And secondly, that he had some dark, covered-up sin in my life that he was going to uncover. 
and tell the people about if I didn't shut up. Well, now that Swaggart has confessed his secret sex life, will it hurt the Republican presidential campaign of TV preacher turned politician Pat Robertson? It could have an impact, but to the true believers, I don't think so. The Moral Majority, founded by Reverend Jerry Falwell, said political damage to the Robertson campaign will be slight because America's 70 million evangelicals do not vote as a bloc. Born-again Christians support a variety of candidates across the spectrum. In fact, the sex scandal couldn't come at a worse time for Pat Robertson, just two weeks away from the Super Tuesday primaries, when his own campaign organization is undergoing a federal audit on suspicion that they were passing the collection plate to raise political contributions. One of several potential buyers of Heritage USA and other PTL properties. After a bankruptcy hearing yesterday in South Carolina, Baker said he was committed to restoring PTL as a Christian retreat, but he wouldn't identify the source of his financial backing. So I have in my hands a letter of credit for $100 million and uh, they are prepared to go higher if necessary. And so we are announcing today that we are actively pursuing the complete buyout of all assets of Heritage USA. PTL's creditors have until August 24th to accept or reject a PTL reorganization plan offered yesterday in court. Get that neck brace off! I knew I was gonna get healed! How did you know? I just knew! For more than four decades, one man has traveled to every continent of the world, proclaiming a message of faith, hope, and deliverance, preaching a message of healing and salvation. Now, Maura Cirillo, God's chosen warrior under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is undertaking the most important project in the annals of modern church history, the Heritage USA Take It Back campaign. To take back for the kingdom of God what the devil tried to steal. To reclaim for God's people a family recreation and ministry center in the heart of the Carolinas accessible to all from around the world. To bring a new honor, dignity, and yes, healing to the body of Christ. So join us now live from the new Heritage USA complex in Charlotte, North Carolina for the Take It Back Telethon with Morris, Teresa, and David Cirillo. Joining them as guests, some of the most anointed Christian leaders and musical artists of our day. Interviews with people just like you who've received a miracle breakthrough from God. Reports from around the Heritage Complex. A host of caring telephone counselors eager to pray for your needs. See some familiar faces and meet some new friends. This will be one of the most important television broadcasts in the history of the body of Christ. And now, welcome to the Take It Back Telephone. Some old partners. I couldn't go on until I released out of my being into this ministry. I could not go on until we gave from our life, letting go of the path. I, I heard over what happened. I was a part of this. I was one of those folks you never know, but I was one of those folks that was on that television set. I'd go preach and I'd come home, turn it on, and see what was happening. I just wanted to see what Tammy was up to. What Jim was, I wanted to watch the singers, and I wanted to see what Henry had to say, and I wanted to listen to Bob and Jeannie and the rest of them, and I just liked that. And I liked this set over here the best. And I had to let go of that old in order for the... I, I had to let go in order for the new to come. And I was a part of... I am a part of this. I'm divinely connected with this... It's God's vision, Morris. It's not just words. It's not just hype. It's just not motivating words. This is God's vision. And it came into your spirit. It came by the Spirit of God. You, listen, you're a busy guy. You're all over the world. You know what I'm saying? And it, it came by the Spirit of God. And I don't want to be the one that didn't do my part to let go. It's almost like forgiveness. You know what I'm saying? You have to forgive in order for you to get your healing or to go on. When you bring your gift to the altar, forgive. It says when you bring your gift to the altar, forgive. You know, I think it'd also be good tonight uh, at the end when we pray for these needs. Don't you think it'd be wonderful tonight if we release a special prayer also for Jim and Tammy right yes, now? Yes, I do. Jim. I do. That, on, that's you. I want Jean, Bob and Jean to come up here. Come on, come on. Do you know... Uh, his father has been here two or three nights in the telethon. Thank you, and, Jesus. And, and he came over to Brother Shul and he told me with tears in his eyes, uh, Jim's father, you know what he said? He said, it, it, I want you to know, Brother Shul, it was hard for me to come here, but he said the presence of God is here. It's still here. And you oh, no, he said, he said it is here in a, even a greater way. And he said, I want you to know 
that we are behind you here. That's God. Come on. That's God. That's God. Now, we, I, 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 we've only got five minutes. I think we ought to pray that prayer right now before we go off the right. air. Right, now listen, Come i got to say, say something. Let's stand. Stand. I gotta say something. Let's stand. i got to say I have something to say real okay. quick. Years ago, I had a dream in the middle of the night. One of God's old saints, and if I told you who it was, you know who he was, was taken off the field. I saw a football field, and one of my heroes was taken off the field about 1960-something, great miracle worker. And I began to cry, and then I saw another football player come in with his shoulder pads on and take his place. You ever seen a football game when someone gets carried off the field? Another one came in, and the Lord spoke to me, Brother Sorello, and he said, One of my servants has been wounded on the field, and I'm putting another one in his place. Jim and Tammy were wounded. Okay, forget all the odds and ends. They were wounded. Now, God's brought another one in, another player on the field, the mission field of life. I saw it. I wept. Brother Srello, God's moved you into this position. I prayed if it was me or Oral or other ones. It wasn't. I prayed for God to have somebody else do it. And I was praying, Lord. Now let's pray. And here's the partners and some more of you need Come to call on. in that are partners, Come on. old Come on. partners. Henry, You've got get Henry over here for and this Susan. Prayer. Come on, Come on Susie, here, Susan. get over here. Come on, David. Come here on. is oh, healing. Mama, get over here. You know, we, 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 we've been trying to call Jim, and we've been trying to call Tammy. Tracy and I, we must have made at least a dozen attempts because we wanted to pray for them personally See, on the, the thing, phone the, to minister to them. We love them. them. We Come love on. them. Come on, folks. Come we on. love them. Come on. I love them. I Come love on. Jim Baker. Yes. I, it's it's kind of like... It's a God kind of love. It's, it's, a, yes. it's a love beyond yes. human frailties. Yes. You know, I don't know. I just, just yes. I can't stop loving them. Boy, we, we better pray. We only got you two. Pray. No, all right, I'll pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, you're a spirit, and we pray. Please hold that music, please. Just the organ, if you will, please play it right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we touch and agree we lift up these two children of yours Jim and Tammy wherever they are now we place them upon your altar before the presence of almighty God and Lord Jesus you are our great high priest I want to look right into this camera right here in the name of Jesus. And I want to call upon every one of the partners and all the friends and all the body of Christ to stretch your hands out in your home right now. I call upon our high priest, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God to turn to these two precious people that we place upon the altar. And Jesus, pray for them now. Intercede before the Father for them now that every wound in their spirit will be healed, that every wound in their mind will be healed, and that there will come a new physical strength and a new forward-looking to what God will do in their lives. Now, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for being a part of the Take It Back Telethon tonight. I want to remind you these telephone lines are still open. We're still here to pray with you, to believe God, to release that wave of God's financial blessing into your life tonight. Please remember that on December the 3rd through the 7th, we're going to be back again with a live revival.
Michael from the New Heritage USA. So mark your calendar December 3 through 7. We look forward to seeing you then. And please, if the phone lines have been busy, try to get through. Keep calling. Keep pressing through. Keep trying. We're still looking for 17 more people to make that gift tonight of at least $1,000 or more. Let's hear from you right now, please, in Jesus' name. That unfinished business. Finish that unfinished business. Let go of the past. Amen. We love you. Uh, what is that? Where is Lollipop? Do you know that Kids Jamboree is about to start? And we need to have Lollipop. Uh, she was supposed to be here, Uncle Sam. Have you seen her? No, Andy, I haven't seen her. I haven't seen her. Anybody seen Lollipop? Yes, Andy. She just walked out the door. Out the door? What is she doing going out the door? We're fixing to start Kids Jamboree, well, and we have got to have Lollipop. Well, let me go and see if I can't find her, Uncle well, Sam. Well, hurry. I'll be right back. I sure hope they hurry back. Hi, boys and girls, and welcome to Kids Jamboree, the fun program. Lollipop. Lollipop, where are you? I'm over here, Aunt Dee. Over where? I'm over here under the tree. I'm laying down. What are you doing over there? Oh, Aunt Dee, it's wonderful. You've got to come over here. God is speaking to me. God is doing what? That's what I said. God is speaking to me. Lollipop. I don't understand what you're talking about. Uncle Sam is waiting for us. Kids Jamboree has started. Oh, Aunt Dee. What? I never knew you were that tall. That's because you're down there and I'm up here. And what are you doing down there? Aunt Dee, God is speaking to me. And, and you can't interrupt God. Look, come sit down with me here. And you can hear God speak, too. It's wonderful. Because I was just laying here looking up into the sky and everything. Look, boys, this is wonderful. Oh, Aunt Dee, look. What? what is it? Oh, What do you see no. now? Is God going to tell us something again? I think so, Aunt Dee. Oh, it's a dead baby bird. Oh, that is Oh. Oh, look at that. But you know something? I think God can speak to us through that little dead bird. You know why? Why? Because God says that he knows every time a little tiny bird dies and falls to the ground and how much more he loves us and cares for us and takes care of the baby bird and don't let those ants bite. Yeesh. The, the ants are God provided too so it would eat dead things and we wouldn't have dead things all over the earth and so God thought of everything but you know what he's saying about the baby bird he loves the baby bird and he provided food for it but he says how much more I care about you more than even that little bird because I provide everything for you and I love you. So God's speaking to us even through a little dead bird. Well, Aunt Dee. You know, I think you've got a good idea being out here letting God talk to us. I think so, too. And you know what? Well, I have an even better idea. In the past, you know, and, and this is not a, a critical thing I'm about to say, but so many of our churches and so many of our people in the church in the past, it's, it's been the place for the good, the well-bodied, and the able. Mm -hmm. You understand know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, it's, the, the church isn't to be like that. The church is to take all, you know, accept, so you know to accept anyone. Do you think we realize that we kind of have that survival of the fittest attitude? Uh, no. I don't know. Because it's... Because if a it's, person falls by the wayside, right. we kind of let them go and say, wow, well, we get judgmental and begin to criticize. Right. And, and we're not to do that. You know, we mm -hmm. need to, if we could only lift up and try to, and just like in the United We Stand, uh, you know, when one needs a hand, our hands will join as one. 
and so many times our hands don't join as one. Our hands, you know, they f break, you know. That's right. Uh, Welcome. We're talking about uh, the new age, which has been featured in Time magazine and many other magazines. You're hearing it on television, the movies, etc. Uh, faith healers, channelers, space travelers, crystals. What's going on in our country? What is this all about? And today we're going to look at uh, one specific area. How is the culture being affected? Mainly our, our psychiatrists. What kind of counseling is being given from the philosophy that revolves out of the new age? And uh, Brooks, I want to come to you here. And there are two godfathers of uh, psychological theory, uh, Freud and Carl Gustav Jung. These two men are the top of the pinnacle. And uh, Freud obviously thought that the unconscious was full of evil. Okay, wanted to stay away from that area. And Jung thought the unconscious was just the opposite. It was full of potential. <coughs> Freud was against religious experiences. Jung was for psychic religious experiences. Freud was the leader and the protege was supposed to take over, but they hit a crossroads right here. And how has that affected the rest of psychology today? What was behind that? I think the people would really like to know. He was the one who won the immediate power struggle, in a sense, because he became the dominating influence over psychology during, uh, during his generation. Freud was the secularist, he was the atheist, he was the materialist, he was the one that carried out an attack on religion. He cleared the ground, as it were, as a part of the advance of secularism, ready for the infilling of this cosmic wisdom that Jung represented. And he elaborated his theories so when the time came, they could be in place. Carl Jung was raised in a home where the poltergeist, demonic, you know, you saw the film Poltergeist, that's the kind of a house he grew up in. And the demonic activity was so intense that his mother kept a daily journal of it. She grew up in a similar house where she had to hold the spirits at bay long enough for her father, Jung's grandfather, to, who was a, a Protestant minister, to write out his Sunday morning sermons. She had to hold the spirits off so he could write out his Sunday morning sermons. Now, he was a master mason. He was an occultist, a medium himself. And his portrait was on the wall of the home in which Carl Jung grew up. And Carl Jung, as a, as a small boy, used to meditate upon his grandfather's portrait until his grandfather stepped out of the frame and they walked off arm in arm into the woods to have their mystical experiences. Now, this is the background to you. Uh, now, the falling out that he had with, with Freud came over whether religious experiences uh, ought to be pursued or whether they were real and so forth. And Freud, in fact, believed that they were all an illusion. And so they were, the first time they met in 1909, they were standing by a bookcase, and Carl Jung said to Freud, well, I'll show you. You're going to hear a shot come right out of this bookcase. And in a few moments, and Freud, the great master, faints dead away. <laughs> the guy was a basket case. I mean, he had so many phobias and neuroses that it's incredible, which he projected on the rest of he us. He made Woody became, Allen look Shane, right? Yeah, which, which, <laughs> right, which became the foundation of what so many people accepted. The second time they met, in 1912, even worse things happened, and Freud fainted dead away again. Now, you have to understand, he had an obsessive fear of death. He was a medical doctor, but he couldn't look at a corpse. He couldn't go to a funeral. And when he came out of this faint, he accused Carl Jung of harboring an unconscious death wish against him, which Carl Jung came to believe when, in a dream, he killed Siegfried, the Wagnerian hero, which he then interpreted, dream interpretation, you got in your Christian bookstores today, as Siegfried. And under the guilt from that, for the next six years, he teetered on the brink of what he himself described as total psychotic breakdown. Because he felt he was going to kill Freud. Right, yes. Because of that dream. Keep going. And at that time, the Holy Ghost came to him in the form of a dove. In a vision. He, 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 had, he had all kinds of spirit entities, as Brooks said. The whole room was full of them. And that was when he picked up Philemon the demon, his spirit guide. He, of course, he doesn't call him that. He simply calls him Philemon. It was Philemon who wrote the Septem Sermon, uh, the, the seven sermons to the dead. And Jung traveled with the dead, you know, and had a... a he had to minister to, to the dead. And it was, in fact, Philemon who gave Carl Jung his basic philosophy. That is, he turned Freud's unconscious into the collective unconscious. Um, 
Here's the compelling thing. Let's flip over the coin and see what Philemon was really coming out with. What is Jungianism? And this is what grabbed me. Freud believed in basic terms that the, what we call the unconscious is the id, and that is this seething, turbulent ocean of negativity inside the primal horde, inside every murderous and perverse desire, okay? We might just call it iniquity. That's what St. Augustine would call it. Jung did a table flip on this. What Jung did is he presented a positive thing inside you. Now, here's what's happening. We have the doorway, perfect doorway for the human potential movement. Here's what Jung said. Welcome to the New Age America video catalog. You are a witness to history in the making. This is the first video catalog ever produced for national television. Not to mention the first for the New Age. During the next half hour, you will be presented with an array of companies and products promoting your well-being. Products that will help make our planet a better place to live. We are all members of the global family. There is only one life, and we all share it collectively. We owe it to ourselves and to the future to contribute to the highest quality of life possible. We are on the verge of the golden global age, the new age. Grab a pen or a pencil and get ready to view some, some very exciting new products and opportunities that can change your life forever. Our first category of the New Age America video catalog is your health and well-being. Don't touch that dial or my friend Swami Vito Ananda will come and break your aura. Save up to 80% on your New Age books, records, CDs, audio, and videotapes with no obligation whatever by joining the New Age Media Club. Save $35 on your first purchase. Get your first two video cassettes for only $4.95 each, plus shipping and handling costs with your membership. The New Age America Video Catalog lets you meet the leading spokespersons, companies, and products within the New Age industry. The New Age America Video Catalog is your key to the future, featuring New Age music, crystals, astrology, numerology, spirituality, books, UFOs, and much, much more. It retails for $19.95 and is yours for only $4.95, a 75% savings. Also, get the Swami Beyond Ananda video cassette. Laugh along with the Swami as he holds forth on such topics as truth decay and speed suffering as a way to pay all your karmic debts quickly. This hilarious video cassette retails for $24.95 and is yours for only $4.95 and 80% savings with your membership. When you join the New Age Media Club, You'll receive both the New Age America video catalog and Swami Beyond Ananda video cassettes for only $4.95 each, plus shipping and handling. Keep both tapes for a full 10 days. If not fully satisfied, return them for a full refund. As a member of the New Age Media Club, you can buy what you want whenever you want to, with no further obligation whatever. You'll receive the club's exclusive newsletter about every four weeks. It will feature the main selection in your favorite category, plus hundreds of other titles, many at special bargain prices. It's easy to get your favorite New Age selection. If you want the main selection, do nothing. It will be sent to you automatically. Those of us foolish enough to still believe that we are the only intelligent life in the universe are very much like those who told Columbus the Earth was flat. We present our next chapter in the New Age America video catalog, UFOs. By 2001, the last barrier to space will be overcome. By 2001, an interstellar spacecraft from the star cluster Pleiades will arrive on Earth. By 2001, the Space Brothers will be helping Earth prepare to become the 33rd member of an interplanetary confederation. Sound fantastic? It is. And it's true. Greetings, friends. I am Uriel, and we are Unarians and preparing the Earth people for the great space fleet landing, the Starship landing in 2001. We have great understanding, teaching, and learning that the Earth from that time on will be a totally different place to live. Man will learn to live at peace with his brother instead of trying to outdo him in everything that he attempts.
the future of the earth world, and this is the truth, the future of the earth world is positive, progressive. We promise you, we brothers of the light and space promise you infinitely and definitely that the future of the earth world will be a positive, progressive, and when they land, it will be a day of days. Can you imagine what it would be like to have these 33,000 very intelligent, advanced spiritual beings to come down into this negative consciousness, this negative atmosphere? The whole world will immediately have a step up, and a big one. And it will be a wonderful thing, and I can hardly wait. Whether or not you believe in spacecraft, whether you are aware and conscious of the many, many thousands of higher intelligent super beings that are projecting their love and their light and their intelligence to the earth world, whether you're aware of these so-called psychic happenings, do above all things believe and be aware that we brothers all, one and all, and we number in the many thousands, we are projecting to you with all of our hearts the infinite love that stems from the most high dimensions. Read about the reality of extraterrestrial life and the future of Earth within an interplanetary confederation in a new book, Preparation for the Landing by Cosmic Visionary Uriel, published by the Unarius Educational Foundation. Call 619-444-7062 for more information. Preparation for the landing. Are you ready? Over 10 years ago, extraterrestrial light beings of incredible love imparted a supreme gift to a woman in Houston, Texas. They gave her the process for a transformational water to unfold higher spiritual awareness, create greater mental and emotional balance, and cleanse the cells in the body. Here is Fantasia, the gift from the stars. Drink a concentrated four-ounce bottle one time. The transformation continues throughout your life. The light within grows brighter. Harmony expands from inner to outer. Cells begin to return to their perfect genetic structure. Research on a woman with radiation sickness shows all bodily functions return to normal. Others have reported equally dramatic benefits in all aspects of health. Listen within and understand Fantasia. Give this universal substance for creating well-being to your whole family. Fantasia, just $79.95 for each lifetime dose. Order now, 1-800-283-2828. That's 1-800-283-2828 world of the crystal cave and the spiritual French connection. Each of you has come into this world for a purpose. When you go to the crystal cave, you meet your master teacher, spirit guides. As you bathe in the crystal bathing pool, it changes colors so that you can cleanse your mind, body, and soul in the light. You'll work with humanity at the crystal healing table as well as yourself. Remember, world harmony begins with you. You will channel information that will help humanity as you work with your master teachers in the crystal cave. This is for someone who has been on the path for many years, as well as the beginner. Order Crystal Cave now so you can move forward on your personal path to enlightenment. Call 1-800-237-6300 to be the spiritual person you desire to be. And of course, you can order the newsletter by calling 1-800-237-6300. Crystal Cave, join the world, join humanity, and help your fellow man. I don't deserve it. I can't have it. The other guy always gets it. How many times have you said that to yourself, hated yourself, and continued to set up a self-destructive belief base, reinforcing it every day with those words? Well, now you can have a longer version of theater of your mind with peaceful ocean scenes stare into the candle flame for deeper concentration as you watch the psychedelic colors flow onto the screen, going deeper and deeper, down, 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 even before you close your eyes. Hi, I'm Daze. Now, you can see yourself as you want to be for a much longer length of time. You can work on specific goals with complete privacy using this personal theater of your mind video. 
Project yourself into a new future now. Accomplish all of your conscious goals. What an easy way to create a new subconscious belief base. Simply call 1-800-237-6300 for your personal theater of your mind video so you can be a winner with speed, ease, comfort, and joy. of late 20th century history, he knew that your generation of young African Americans would be characterized by genius and greatness. But he knew of the terrible ancient force of self-destruction tearing at you like some incurable disease. And so he knew what he had to do. He would travel back in time and deliver a message, tell you how important you were in the grand scheme that would give rise to an incredible new civilization. Because of the incredible physical forces involved, no human could actually travel personally back in time. Instead, a system was developed utilizing a form of holographic representation tied to human consciousness. The result was a ghostly form that could see and be seen, but could not touch or be touched. It was this hologrammatic twin that Asata would send back into the 20th century. But once there, where would he go? How would he get his message across? The archives spoke of a video program known as Teen Summit and a legendary group of ancient ones on a quest for truth and knowledge. They are referred to in the historical chronicles simply as the Posse. My name, My name is Dr. Is Dr. Asada Kabal. I am from the year 2050. I am a scientist. I have perfected, I have perfected a system, system of time travel, travel that has allowed me to come here in 1990 to Teen Summit to meet the Posse and you and to deliver a message to you. It's one that you must have in your home. It's a video cassette containing everything that we're talking about tonight and much, much more. In fact, the title of it is Russia. World War III and Armageddon. We're going to take a break right now and tell you how you can receive this very exciting, exciting offer. Can the world live in peace? Will the collapse of communism spell the end of war and strife? Does Glasnost and Perestroika mean that Russia has really changed? Dr. Jack Vanapie says no. Known as the Walking Bible and one of America's foremost prophecy scholars, he has prepared a shocking videotape that reveals the truth about Russia, World War III, and Armageddon. Using careful historical research and thorough biblical documentation, Dr. Vanapie shows how current international events signaled the approach of the world's greatest military confrontation and the return of Jesus Christ. See the truth with your own eyes on this powerful video. You'll also receive a full color, 22 by 17 inch study map of the prophetic and historic developments leading to Armageddon and the end of time. Will Russia invade Israel? When? Why? What is presently preventing World War III? Find the answers in this explosive videotape, Russia, World War III, and Armageddon. To order your copy, call the toll-free number on your screen and have your credit card ready. Turn out today's news relates to biblical prophecies thousands of years old. Ray Brubaker traces current world events to their ancient prophecies. Join him weekly in God's News Behind the News for the real truth about today's news. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific on PTL, the inspirational network. Of the horrors that Nazism dreamed of, communism has accomplished. It, indeed, is the ultimate evil that this world has ever seen, and it must be removed. Therefore, it's vital that Americans, and Christians especially, not be deceived as to what communism is. Only today, 
I heard some people on television talking about what a wonderful thing communism really was. But I would like for you to hear today from a man who knows it intimately, beyond the rhetoric, beyond the facade, the reality of what communism really means. Reverend Harlan Popoff was the outstanding Protestant minister in Bulgaria until he was captured by the communists and spent some 14 years in a communist prison, enduring tortures that are beyond description. I want you, every Christian in this country, to read this book, this intimate account of what it means to come face to face with red communism. Since Oral Roberts took his sermons from the tent to TV in 1954, part of his message has always been, something good is going to happen to you. Last Sunday, he told his audience something bad was going to happen to him unless they came up with four and a half million dollars. I need some very quick money. I mean, I need it now. I am desperate to turn this around. I need to turn it around and up so I'll know when March comes, I won't be taken. I'll get to live. Roberts claims God has mandated him to raise money for a missionary project. He says God has told him if he doesn't, he'll die. His half-billion-dollar Tulsa-based evangelical empire is in trouble. The university's dental school has closed, the law school given away, and the medical center, built to hold 777 patients, rarely treats more than 100 at a time. The hospital is in so much financial trouble, it now offers to fly patients here for free if they have insurance to pay for their stay. Roberts is still one of the biggest employers in Tulsa, and critics here have been hard to find. But this latest call for cash has changed all that. People don't like the idea from the letters and calls we're getting that he has put a price tag or God has put a price tag on his head. Or Roberts wouldn't talk with us, but his son did. My father is not a person that uses scare tactics or fear tactics but he does tell people what God speaks. But fewer and fewer people are hearing Oral's message. He's lost more than half his TV audience in the last 10 years, and critics charge he's exploiting those who remain. These people have made a connection to him, and he's exploiting these people now, uh, probably with the, ec the ultimate um, device you could imagine. That's emotional blackmail. Please help me. Oral Roberts has always promised faith can make miracles happen. Now, faith is not enough. He says only money. Please forgive me for sinning against you. And to the hundreds of millions that I have stood before in over a hundred countries of the world, And I've looked into the cameras. And so many of you with a heart of loneliness, needing help, have reached out to the minister of the gospel as a beacon of light. You that are nameless, most I will never be able to see you except by faith. I have sinned against you. I beg you, forgive me. And most of all, to my Lord and my Savior, my Redeemer, the one whom I serve and I love and I worship. I bow at his feet who has saved me and washed me and cleansed me. I have sinned against you, my Lord. And I would ask that your precious blood would wash and cleanse every stain 
until it is in the seas of God's forgetfulness, never to be remembered against me anymore. I say unto you that watch me today, through his mercy, his grace, and his love, the sin of which I speak is not a present sin, it is a past sin. I know that so many would ask, why? Why? I have asked myself that 10,000 times through 10,000 tears. Maybe Jimmy Swaggart has tried to live his entire life as if though he was not human. And I have thought that with the Lord, knowing he is omnipotent and omniscient, that there was nothing I could not do. And I emphasize with his help and his guidance. And I think this is the reason in my limited knowledge that I did not find the victory I sought because I did not seek the help of my brother and my sister in the Lord. I've had to come to the realization this gospel is flawless, even though it is ministered at times by flawed men. If I had sought the help of those that loved me with their added strength, I look back now, and I know that victory would have been mine. They have given me strength, along with the compassion of our Savior in these last few days, that I had needed for a long, long time. Many ask, as I close this, will the ministry continue? Yes, the ministry will continue. <laughs> Stand against you. And I have brought disgrace and humiliation and embarrassment upon you. I beg your forgiveness. Swagger didn't detail his sin, and a Louisiana Assemblies of God official suggested he resist the desire to respond to questions. He also asked the congregation not to speculate about it. The scandal broke open late last week following a trip by Swagger to the Assemblies of God National Headquarters in Springfield, Missouri. There have been reports since Friday that church officials in Springfield reviewed photographs supposedly showing Swagger entering and leaving a hotel room with a prostitute. 
Today, Swaggart neither confirmed nor denied any of that, but he accepted the blame for a sin described by a colleague as a moral failure. I have no one but myself to blame. I do not lay the fault or the blame or the charge at anyone else's feet. For no one is to blame but Jimmy Swaggart. I take the responsibility. I take the blame. I take the fault. The latest round in TV's Holy Wars began last fall when another disgraced TV minister, Marvin Gorman, reportedly got the incriminating pictures of Swaggart and the alleged prostitute. The intriguing story of how that all came about will appear in this week's Newsweek magazine, and it was written by feature writer George Hackett. George, what is the story? Well, Gorman uh, got some anonymous tips to the effect that Swaggart was uh, seeing a prostitute. He uh, hired a detective who followed Swaggart, uh, went to a motel where Swaggart uh, entered with the prostitute, photographed that uh, entry, and then called Gorman up and told him, if you want to catch him, get on down here. And Gorman went down. Now, this all allegedly happened last October. Why were the photographs held until now? Uh, according to our sources, Gorman claims that he held onto the pictures trying to get Swagger to come clean on his own privately, to humble himself. When this didn't happen, he felt he had no choice but to give the photos over to the Assemblies of God. Was all this a setup? Uh, Gorman had an ax to grind because Swagger had said, made allegations about him. Is that not true? No one's talked to Gorman yet. He's not talking. But uh, people w within the Assemblies of God do not think that uh, Gorman did this deliberately to uh, get Swagger out at this point. Now, the church elders still have to decide what kind of action to take against uh, Swagger. What do you anticipate, having worked this story, is going to happen now. According to the bylaws of the Assemblies of God, uh, an adultery act uh, must be followed by a two-year suspension from preaching, essentially, which would mean that Swaggart would be off the air for two full years. Uh, they might be a little bit more lenient with him because he is worth a lot of money to that church. Uh, he gave 12 million to them last year. He's the most prominent preacher uh, of the Assemblies of God, and in fact, in television uh, evangelism. So he, he is responsible for raising millions every year. 150 million. With these dollars. latest allegations, George, uh, is it possible for the TV ministry to survive? This is a bigger blow even than Jim and Tammy Baker. Uh, if they were the, uh, the, the, the ministries are still reeling after that event, and uh, it just remains to be seen whether someone can go off the air and come back again. It's never happened before. Is running out of those sores. And he's uh, sitting there, and he's uh, wanting just some scraps from the table. And he's using some chips to, to sc scrape the pus out of his sores. He's in, his whole body is in anguish. Notice what happens. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. That old scavenger flea hound dog came up, had more compassion on this beggar than the rich man did. And this, the, these dogs came up and they licked the sores of this poor old beggar. What a comforting thing to do. I imagine the people stood back, oh, he's a beggar, don't get near him, you might get some of that disease. Consider, if you will, Samuel Hodges, a student, 21, single, alone in a darkened room, lost in a world of television viewing, aimlessly wandering in a vacuum of meaninglessness, unable to find satisfaction in a great wasteland of electronic insignificance. Consider also, Act It Out, an alternative to current network television, a program where you write the script and a live studio audience discusses issues that are important to young adults as well as their parents and where moral absolutes are still used to make decisions. No longer will television viewing be meaningless. No longer will viewers be lost in the static zone. I like just lay down the payment and tell me what they want. No questions, no excuses. They call us post fetal abortionists, PFAs for short. We're part of the Institute of Public Health and Social Affairs.
They tell us we're performing a public service by eliminating stress and population problems. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe not. But it pays the bills. <laughs> Just talking about it. Here's a group, Megadeth. Uh, I think that the the uh, the death uh, songs, the the suicide songs, the uh, destruction songs, the murder songs, call it whatever you want to call it. But uh, there is an infatuation in this in this music with death. Uh, there's another Megadeth album, and uh, I mean the the figures, uh, the the lyrics, uh, you name it. Uh, Iron Maiden, and uh, there have been young people who have committed murders. Uh, I'm thinking of a young man in in Toronto right now that uh, that testified that Eddie, the, the figure that's used here, uh, told him to do it, but. Uh, uh, this one happens to be the number of the beast, and uh, we have pictures of Satan and all the, the the flames of hell down here, and and the the death uh, picture. Here's a here's a great album, uh, Possessed. Uh, you know, I mean, what what are, what are kids supposed to uh, to think of when they when they get involved in this stuff? Here's that speed metal one that he was just talking about, and uh, all of the good-looking Sunday school kids here getting ready to go to Sunday school. Uh, I mean, you know, it just if if you go into a to a record store and and look at these album covers, uh, you don't have to listen to the music. You can just look at the covers and and realize what is we uh, we think she's a. Uh, She's a good kid. Now, what, what in the world brought you to Freedom Village? Suicide, um, rebellious. Suicide? You weren't successful, were you? Did no. you kill yourself? If things are this bad now, where are we going to be 10 years from now? Uh, yesterday, we got to talking about uh, rock music, uh, you know, and, and how it progressively has gotten worse and worse and into the, the, uh, the horror and the weird and the, the gruesome and the ghoulish type of stuff. Uh, by the way, if you were not here yesterday, you missed uh, the headbanging. Uh, we, uh, we, we got talking about headbanging, and uh, afterwards, our, our production crew decided to, to try it. They're, they're all knocked out now. They're not here. We've got a new crew today. Uh, <clears throat> some of them got welts in their heads and what have you. But, uh, you know, we, we take a look at music, and we realize that, that uh, the rock music sets the trend. Uh, where do our young people today get the uh, concepts that they have about love and what love, if you will? Hi, I'm Jessica Hahn, and when people hear my name, they think of headlines, scandal, and controversy. But very few people know my side of the story, and almost no one knows how I really feel. Now I'm ready to reveal the secrets I have held for so long and share my most personal thoughts with you. You'll be shocked and amazed at what I have to say about Jessica Hahn. Jessica Hahn. On tells all. Call 1-900-568-6868. Two dollars a minute. Adults only. Please. Reverend Carl, here's a minister. Healing flows into you, my brother. There's the heat of God going into that hernia this very moment. Put your hand on that spot. In Jesus' name. I just saw a spot on a lung disappear. Someone's going to go back and get an x-ray. And that, that spot is gone off of your lung. Just then, just when I saw that, it must have been someone earlier that obeyed the Spirit of God. Madeline from Jacksonville, $1,000. You know, you folks know I like $1,000. Greetings, everyone. We greet you from the Universal World Church, located near the intersection of Beverly and Alvarado, in the beating heart, the geographical center of Los Angeles the most powerful church in the world today, in our opinion. My subject in this service of the seven days and nights of anointing and for the mighty transubstantiation communion miracle is the miraculous feast of Revelation Tabernacles for the pure gold Philadelphian Revelation Church. The feast of Revelation Tabernacles 
At these seven days and nights of anointing, we celebrate God's seven greatest feasts. And they are the Feast of Revelation First Fruits, Revelation Tabernacles, Revelation Lights, Revelation Trumpets, Revelation Pentecost, Revelation Atonement, and the Revelation Passover on the seventh day. The scriptures that I will speak to you about are found written in Leviticus chapter 23 and in the Revelation at chapter 21 and in St. John 7. In Leviticus 23, 34, it states with regard to the Feast of Tabernacles, quote, speak unto the children of Israel saying, the fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. You're believing God for a new bicycle or whatever. Motorcycle. Write down all of your goals. Watch them motorcycles, man. They'll, they'll tear you up, boy. That's right. They tore the captain up. That's for sure. A go-kart then. Well, I don't know. Whatever. Well, anyhow, you can set I some goals. You know what? If you've got friends that aren't very nice and don't have good manners, or maybe they need their mouth washed out with soap, they don't talk nice, or maybe they get in trouble a lot, always into mischief. If you've got friends like that, you could very well turn out just like your friends. Because, you know, you hang around a bad apple, you become a bad apple too. That's why the Bible teaches so much about who you run with and choosing your friends. Did you know that when God moved his people, the Israelites, his chosen people, into a special country, into Canaan, the very country that he planned for them to live in, he told them to go in and possess the land. He right. gave them that land, but there was already people living in that land, and they were worshiping idols and statues, and God said, you go in there, I've given you that land, but you've got to kill all those people that are in that land first, because they're all idol worshipers. Hmm. Of course, in these days, we wouldn't do that, and God wouldn't tell us to. But in those days, thousands of years ago, it was a lot different because the laws were so different. Uh, uh, what's going on here, you Officer go, Smitty? Wait a minute. Buddy, <laughs> wait a minute. Hold it, hold it. Uh, uh, stand still there. One of the stowaways. Uh-huh. Yeah. One of the stowaways. What are the charges against this man, Officer? This is Demas, Captain. Demas. Demas. Read the charges. Demas, he loved the pleasures of sin more than the pleasures of serving God. You mean he'd rather go out and gamble and lie and cheat and steal than to remain faithful to you God? You got it, Captain. He's what else? Real... He's a mean one. That's it. He would rather go out and gamble. He'd rather go out and lie. He'd jump ship. Well, Some you know, Officer charges. Smitty, we don't make people Sound walk the plank. God does not make people walk the plank. But when people refuse to walk in the principles of God, what this book says, it's our roadmap, it's our chart, and over here hey. in Romans, the sixth uh. chapter and the 23rd verse, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ uh. Jesus our Lord. This man has made his choice to walk the plank. That's right. You see, God doesn't make people walk the plank. I don't make people walk the plank. Smitty is not making people walk the plank, but they make their own decision to go their own way and to do their own thing but they don't follow God's word. Officer, lead him to the plank. He's it's not worthy to be on board the, the old gospel Let's ship. Go. He'll only cause trouble. He'll Come only on. cause trouble. He's not worthy to be on board the old gospel ship. We're on board the old gospel ship, and Jesus is Lord. He's the captain of the old gospel ship. You're not going to believe this one. Uh -oh. She lied to the Holy Ghost. Lied to the Holy Ghost. Uh -oh. The Bible talks about people like her, yes. She's going to have her place in the lake of fire because she's lied to the Holy Ghost, and uh, the Bible says that all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Uh, that's right. Now, Sapphira, the Bible tells the story all about her. But she's lied to the Holy Ghost. She's a hypocrite. She's got big problems. She's made her own choice, Smitty. Where is she going? Off the plank, leader to the Let's go, plank. Sapphira. Listen for the screams and gnashing Come of teeth in the dark. Come on. Because she falls Jump. overboard and those man-eating shots. <laughs> Sad. The next person, we're going to find out what fault he is. The... Wait, there's some mistake. 
Jesus, the Son of God. What fault do you find in this man? What are the charges against God's Son, Jesus? Captain, we find no fault in him. There's something different about his words. When he talks to people, they just, they're changed. The deaf, they, they start to hear again. The blind, they can see. The suicidal, they want to live again. I don't know, that some, even the dead are changed by his words, and they, they come back to life. Jesus, there's something about his name. Lame legs are made to walk again. Blinded eyes can see. One man by the name of Lazarus was dead and buried in the grave. Jesus came to the tomb and called him by name and said, Lazarus, come forth. Immediately, Jesus had spoken, and that dead body came back to life because Jesus had summoned his name. And someone has said, if Jesus hadn't have called him by name, every grave around the world would have busted open. That's how much power there is in the name of Jesus. Officer, remove the bondages from his hands. We can't make him walk the plank. He's the captain of the old gospel ship. He's the one that's paid for our sin. He's the one that's made all things right. Jesus, our Savior, he paid for your sin, and he's already walked the plank for you when he was nailed to that cross, when they took his hands and nailed him to the cross, when they took his feet and nailed his feet to the cross. Jesus, God's only son, paid for your sin, and now we can't make him walk the plank because he's already walked the plank at Calvary. That cross became the plank. Now you and I don't have to walk that plank because of Jesus. Please. And you can be a crew member on the old gospel ship for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin